Hey everyone, welcome back to Newcastle Fans TV. I am joined by the Matthew Raysbeck, the BBC Radio Newcastle commentator. Um, pleasure to have you on, Matthew. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking. Um, it, how are you doing at the moment with all this coronavirus stuff? I hope you, you and your family are well. Yeah, all, all fine. Um, as you can see, I probably need a home haircut soon. Uh, it's getting yeah. a bit wild, but um, if that's the uh, biggest worry that I've got, then yeah, everything's fine. I think just like all of us, we're just missing football really it's been a long what four or five weeks since we last mm -hmm. had a game and um it could be some time yet until we're back on the pitch and uh football resumes massive massive news at the moment i think you probably know where i'm going with this <laughs> newcastle are very much in the news um the takeover is one of the most talked about things in english football presently um what do you make of what you've heard so far well uh it all really gathered pace didn't it on tuesday morning yeah. Um, I know it had been around for a couple of months. It was ahead of the Oxford Cup tie at the end of January when it was the Wall Street Journal who broke the news uh, about the interest. Amanda Staveley, um, the Saudi private investment, uh, public investment fund, the Sovereign Wealth Fund and, and the Rubin Brothers being involved. So uh, we'd gone a, a couple of months without hearing a, a great deal. Um, and yeah, Tuesday was an interesting day because it, it really all happened quite quickly. And we got to a stage where it was known that it was with the Premier League now and they were carrying out checks under their owners and directors test. Um, and the excitement that that brought was completely understandable. Um, I, at this stage, I can't add anything to what's out there already, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's this unquenchable thirst for, for more information and, of course, news that uh, something has been concluded and that the sale has gone through. Um, as far as we know at the BBC, that the Premier League process can take two to four weeks, could take longer because of the current situation, or perhaps it might even happen a little faster because there isn't as much other business going on. Um, I'm not entirely sure of the exact time frame and, and then what needs to happen in order for everything to, to go through finally. Um, it would be, I mean, sensational transformative yeah. news for Newcastle United if this did go through. But I think too many fans have allowed themselves to get excited. Too many people in the media, probably myself included, have been in a position where we felt something was going to happen in the past and it didn't. So um, the, I would still urge a bit of caution because we've been down this road before, but we haven't quite been this far down the road, I think, in the 13 years of Mike Ashley. Yeah, definitely. And and staying on that, do you, does it for you? Does it feel different this time as a as a journalist? Does it feel different for you? Have you heard different things? How, what's the feel of it um, around journalism and, and other colleagues that you have? Well, uh, for the last couple of weeks, because there hasn't been any football or we haven't had any sports programs, I haven't really been following things too closely. Um, but in terms of the timeline from probably the new year up until now, everything that we've heard and, and that we understood indicated that, that this was really genuinely serious. I think back to last summer, uh, end of May, the Bin Zayed group uh, and the news that, that we got then. I mean, this certainly, as soon as this was known or, you know, there were whispers about something going on, it, it immediately felt different to that. And I think um, obviously now we're in a, in a situation, we keep hearing the word unprecedented, unprecedented, don't we, about the general situation in society at the moment. I think in terms of Newcastle takeovers, we're probably at that stage where it is unprecedented. I don't think we've been this far along. And I think there's a degree of confidence in the way it's been reported from some of the newspapers nationally and locally. A number of those journalists are extremely well connected, not just in football, but in terms of uh, this kind of story. And of course, no one would print anything or write anything or publish anything that they weren't completely confident in um, and without going to reliable sources. So I know that there have been um, one or two articles that, that maybe supporters have been um, looking at and, and wondering, does that contradict other things that we've heard? But what we've seen generally is that this has moved on to such a degree where it is considered to be to be closer than ever before. Yeah, um, 100%. I mean, for, for me as a fan, it's, and many of the lads with Newcastle Fans TV, we've all agreed it seems a lot different. And there is a mixture of us. Some of, of some of us have gone in with two feet. Other, others of, of, of us don't want our fingers burnt. 
So it's just one of those situations where you have to stand back. And, um, you know, we've heard about which parties are involved in the deal. Um, what do you make of Amanda Stavey's return to the table and like her persistence with trying to obtain Newcastle? Well, she hasn't really gone away, has she? Um, I, I remember when um, the talks were ended by Mike Ashley in early 2018 and he described it as a waste of time. She gave an interview to the Times newspaper and um, I, I can recall the way that she spoke about it then and she sounded as if she was very determined uh, in her attempts to acquire Newcastle United. And, and I know around that time uh, that there was talk that she was still interested and she may come back in the future. And, you know, we're two and a half years on almost from that period, certainly from the, the Liverpool game in October 2017, when we first saw her in the stands at St. James's Park. Yeah. Um, so this is obviously, I think, felt like a, um, well, what it's turned out to be a, a long-term commitment for her in the sense that, she has come back and she's brought this thing together to get it to the stage mm -hmm. that it's at. Um, we all know about her. I think that she was involved in that takeover that transformed Manchester City 11 years ago. And there was an unsuccessful attempt that she was involved in to acquire Liverpool when Rafa Benitez was there. So obviously when Rafa was at Newcastle, there was an established link between the two, which I think was very exciting uh, for supporters. What that means about now and the future, well, I'm not quite sure, but of course, it's very easy to make the connection between her and Rafa Benitez. Um, she's from North Yorkshire as well. So I suppose relatively local to Newcastle. Um, but obviously, this is the kind of thing that she does. Brokers deals, is involved in big money transactions um, and clearly wants to get involved in football and, and particularly Newcastle United. And because it's been obviously a longer term thing, and I think some of the research and the work that was done a couple of years ago, as we understand, this is someone who is obviously serious about uh, being well informed about the club and the city and what the club means. And when Mike Ashley bought the club in 2007, he famously didn't do due diligence. And I don't think he really knew what he was getting into. So everything I think that we've been told and that is out there about Amanda Staveley, certainly, and perhaps the Rubin brothers who have business interests in Newcastle and in the North East would suggest that they might have a, a good idea about what exactly they could be getting into if this goes through. Yeah, and we'll touch again on Rafa a little bit later on. Uh, that's another question I have for you. Um, but, fine. you know, as, as, part of, as part of the deal, we've heard that um, obviously, there are three parties in, in in the deal. You've got Amanda Stavely, who is reportedly going to have a stake of 10% in the club. Ruben Brothers with another 10%. And then um, the Saudi Arabian Public Investment Fund uh, with a whopping 80% of the deal. Um, do you think they're going to be the ones pumping the money into the club? I mean, it's, it's expected to be that. What's like? What's your opinion on them as well? And especially with the human rights issues that revolve around them. Um, what sort of things are you thinking on that? Well, a lot of the um, the comments on social media in the last couple of days has been from journalists and I think mainly from fans of other clubs uh, about the Saudi Arabian human rights record. We've seen comments again from uh, Amnesty International who were critical at the end of January, understandably, because that's a position we would expect a body and an organisation like them to take. That won't go away. It won't go away whether... Um, the Saudi uh, sovereign wealth fund is central to this Newcastle takeover or whether this doesn't happen at all. Uh, those concerns, those questions will still be there. But of course, because Newcastle United could be um, involved with them, um, questions will be asked about Newcastle United. I firstly think it's quite unfair uh, for the supporters to be criticised for being excited about the possibility of a uh, a change of ownership of the club because it's what most fans have wanted for a very long time, let's be honest, and they've been very vocal about that. And I think anyone who knows anything about Newcastle understands exactly why the appetite for change is there. And the supporters don't get to choose who the club is sold to. No. Like They didn't get to choose Mike Ashley um, when Freddie Shepard and Sir John Hall were in power at the club. Um, so the supporters will obviously be caught up in all of this. I suppose it's very Newcastle, isn't it, that what could be a, a really significant turning point in the club's history could be um, tainted a, a little bit to whatever extent you want to say it might be by 
um, those questions, those uncomfortable questions that are, are being asked about Saudi Arabia. Um, my colleague, John Anderson, who played for Newcastle for 10 years in the 80s and 90s and uh, who we do the commentaries with and co-presents our total sport phone in every weeknight, has always said that if Mike Ashley sells the club, fine. Uh, and he, I think, like all of us, has understood that that has needed to happen for some time for all the reasons that it's needed to happen. You've got to have somebody who can not only afford to buy it, but that can afford to then run it yeah. and hopefully invest. So if we're talking about the kind of wealth that the people coming into the club potentially would have, then not only would they be able to afford to buy it, they would be able to to run it in a way that would help the club, club develop and grow. And look, I don't think any of us are expecting or demanding the mm -hmm. kind of money that's in Manchester City, but obviously just enough to make the club more competitive, to have a go, to try and win cups, to try and get into Europe, to not be looking over our shoulders every season, maybe to do a little bit more in the community um, and, of course, invest in facilities, academy training ground, whatever can be done with the stadium. So the kind of money that these people have, you think may well enable them to be able to do that with Newcastle. Once again, the usual caveat supply, assuming this all goes through. Yeah, and it's a very exciting prospect when you look at it from... From a, a far back perspective, I think a lot of people just think about the 11 players on the pitch and the manager on the sideline. But you look at the community around the club and the training ground and all those key elements and even even the, the bits of land that have been sold outside the ground. There, I've seen a few articles on, on the Saudi, Saudi Arabians possibly wanting to buy that back as well, which would be massive. Um, so there's so many different aspects of it that are excited uh, to be get excited about and we can only dream of the money that Manchester City have, but I think, as as you said, most fans just just want to be able to compete, and that is a crucial thing for any football club. Because at the end of the day, for all we know, if we'd stuck with Ashley any longer, we could be with the likes of Sunderland down in League One. I had to throw them in there because <laughs> um, <laughs> got to slate the ones down the road. Um, but you know, staying on the takeover for a little bit longer, um, we've had links with like big players and managers. Um, but one of the standout links, and we did bring him up earlier, Rafa Benitez uh, has been uh, linked with making a return as Newcastle manager, um, yes. which I, I think a lot of fans would love to see. Do you think it would be the right thing for him to make his way back? Or do you think it's best to make a look out for someone else and uh, have a fresh start if we get new owners? Um, I think as with anything at the moment, there are still more questions than answers. Uh, the big question, of, of course, is, is this takeover going to happen? And then... What does it mean for Newcastle? And, and that, I think, um, comprises all the things we've just talked about, about the possibility of investment and, and where supporters would think that the club needs to improve uh, and change the way it does things. But also on the football side of it, I mean, would there really be great opposition to a return for Rafa Benitez? Absolutely not. Um, he is in a, a very lucrative contract in China and he's not quite 12 months through that. Um, obviously, football is on hold uh, across the world uh, in, in most countries, um, but he would still have, obviously, two years left on his deal in, um, in the Chinese Super League, and I think it's been widely reported that to get him out of that would, would cost, a, well, cost a fortune, wouldn't it? Now, Newcastle may be owned by people who could afford to buy him out of that contract, um, and I mentioned the link with Amanda Staveley as well. Um, that could well be significant in time. Um, will it happen? I don't know. I, I think we all know that he wanted to stay at Newcastle, but he wanted the conditions to be um, to be different. He wanted the club to do things differently. Um, he had his ideas. The club had their own. And, and ultimately, over you know many months of talking and um, at the end of the season, a few weeks until we till we found out that he was leaving, it, it all just broke down. Uh, so he wouldn't come back under the current regime. A change of ownership may well lead to that happening. But again, without speaking to Rafa Benitez, we don't quite know what he's thinking. He had three and a bit years at Newcastle. Um, he always spoke very positively about his experience here, about the city, the fans, the club generally and what it could be. And of course, the players and what they achieved with him. Um, but should you go back? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, really, at this stage, 
I don't know. The one thing I would say is in all of this, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about Steve Bruce in, in a bit more detail, but um, I would feel pretty sorry for Steve Bruce mm-hmm. if something happened uh, to him in terms of him not being here, if a takeover went through, because that often is one of the first things that occurs when there's a change of ownership. Mm-hmm. Uh, it took a few months under, under Sam Allardyce after Mike Ashley bought the club, but um, that changed. And of course, they brought somebody back, a, 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 an ex-manager player, a legend at Newcastle in Kevin Keegan, and it didn't work out, ultimately did it. Um, so could history repeat itself with Rafa Benitez? says, I'm not sure. But I, I don't think there would be any shortage of support and desire to see that happen from the fans because of how respected and how loved Rafa is still. I think, yeah, what you mentioned about Bruce as well is exactly spot on. I share that point of it would be extremely harsh to to just get rid of him before the season's even finished. Um, I think probably the best option with someone like Steve Bruce, who, must I mention, has done a fantastic job this season, considering many fans' expectations at the start of it. Um, many fans were left disappointed with his appointment um, and thought we'd be lingering down right down the bottom of the table. But Newcastle have managed to steer clear, and that sometimes is down to the players alone, but some of it has been down to his excellent game planning um you think of manchester united at home um and some other game and even west brom in the cup as well he's, he's been he's given us a cup run this season so what so would would you share that view that he should be able to stay on to the end of the season or possibly even longer or just the end of the season well as i said i do hope the season is completed and, and one of the reasons i hope it's completed and it's 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 selfish from a newcastle point of view but we've got an fa cup quarter final and a chance of getting to wembley to play um, in in one, hopefully two, meaningful cup games. And it's been so long uh, since since that was the case. I mean, there will be people watching this who don't remember the last time Newcastle played an FA Cup match at Wembley. They won't remember the semi-final in 2000 or the, the two finals in the late 90s, um, which, were, which were both very, very disappointing. Steve Bruce, yes, they've played two League One teams in the championship side, has got Newcastle into the quarterfinals for the first time um, since before Mike Ashley owned the club. And, and the fact that they hadn't progressed for a long time in the cup hasn't been lost on supporters. Um, and of course, in the league, well, the position, thanks to the win at Southampton, is quite comfortable. And that week before the season was suspended, I know Burnley at home probably wasn't great, but there have been worse home matches this season. And we started to see some improvements with the change in formation. And, and really, I felt it was a game that, that they should have won, that, that really they ought to have won. Um, but then West Brom was exciting. It was a bit of a comeback, but the game was won. And Southampton was was really good. I thought they were better 11 against 11. And it was just a shame that, that everything was halted then when we saw signs of progress and um, some interesting fixtures to come. But in terms of, of Steve Bruce... I think every time we've been in in a bit of peril this season, Arsenal and Norwich, they went and won at Spurs. Now he he made some changes for that game, got a good result. Yes, they had to defend. A lot of people said it was a Rafa Benitez like performance, but it was a great result. It was a great day. Uh, Manchester United came on the back of the five nil defeat by Leicester. So again, he and the players got it right, got together, turned it around. Um, and then they went on that, that good run in November and into December before, obviously, issues over Christmas and New Year. And Bruce has criticised a lot for his selections and not resting players and for complaining about the fixture schedule and not using the squad properly. And I think some of those criticisms were valid and he's admitted that himself um, subsequently. Uh, but then, you know, en- ending that with the the draw with Wolves, which was shaping up to be a a game I thought that they were going to go to win before Gale got injured. Win over Chelsea. Everton was terrible, but the final couple of minutes were great. So they, they have had this ability to turn it around. And I think he deserves credit for that. Um, he's really well liked in football. He is well respected. He's not Rafa Benitez, but I don't think he would ever try to tell you that he's anything like Rafa Benitez. Mm-hmm. Um, the players seem fond of him. The approach is different this year. I think generally it is a bit more relaxed at the training ground and around the club because of the way that he and his staff look after the players. Um, But I have to say, Rafa Benitez is a fantastic football man, a very sincere, genuine person. And what we saw in front of the camera is the Rafa that 
in the media, we were very, very lucky to see as well. And when we had the access to him that we did, you know, we, we completely understood why people love him and why people would be, um, we find him almost mesmerizing and really buy into what he wants. Steve Bruce is just as sincere, just as nice. And he's got presence just like Rafa Benitez has, you know, when he walks into the room, you know, it, he's got plenty about him. And there's a side to him when you're not recording, he's got some fantastic stories, um, loves football, talk all day. He's a fascinating character. And sometimes I wish that supporters could see that side as well. Yeah. It might not change your opinion of the results on the pitch or the performances or the direction of the club, but I think maybe people might be a little less harsh in their uh, judgment of him. I think that is a, a, a very valid point in the fact that I think it happens across every every football team. People seem to forget that football managers and football players are, are real people as well. and They have a personality off the pitch and, and out of football. And personally, I can see that Steve Bruce is, is, a, is a nice guy. And... Um, you know his football isn't always great, um, but he's 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 done a good job. Um, he's as you said, he's got us into a quarter final. I just want to touch on that as well. What do you make of that quarter final? Because obviously we've been drawn against, at home against Manchester yeah. City. We've won um, two of our last three home games against Manchester City. Um, the last game we lost against them at home was one nil back in 2017. Um, when Raheem Sterling scored. So what do you make of that? Do you think Manchester City will be frightened at the prospect of attending St. James's Park? Or, mm-hmm. Well, when the draw was made, um, I, I was disappointed because I wanted to avoid them. I think I think that's just common sense, isn't it? You want to avoid the very top teams. Um, but then the more I thought about it, the more it occurred to me that actually we, we would have a chance and we would have a good chance against them because, as you say, those results, I mean, earlier in the season... That was that was a good performance against Manchester City. It was one of the most enjoyable matches um, I think that we've had uh, this year because there have been some games that haven't been good this season, but also in in the previous two Premier League campaigns as well. There were some some home games that weren't great, but we enjoyed that one, that two all draw, and yeah. uh, last season the win to turn it around in the way that they did after going behind on the night when the Almiron deal was happening as well. It was a, a great evening, one that I don't think we'll forget. So, you know, this team, which is still largely unchanged from a, a couple of years ago, knows how to get a result against them, knows how to play against them. Take into account that 1-0 defeat in the first season back up. I mean, that was close. They just defended, didn't they, for about 75 minutes and then pushed on and had a couple of nibbles and could have got something. But even last season away and the year before, you know, they were still quite tight, close games. Last mm-hmm. season away at Man City, we were level at half time and took a great goal, a long range strike from Carl Walker to win it. So, yeah, a recent record would tell you that they would have had a chance. The one thing that I'm sad about, and I think we all are, is that Saturday evening game on television, big match, chance to get to Wembley. Um, they, they just didn't go ahead because I thought the conditions were would have been there. The ingredients were there for it to be a, a really great night. So I hope we get the chance to play it and yeah. get the chance to hopefully go through. But Manchester City are an, an incredible team. So, of course, it would it would never be easy. But having beaten lower league teams, you're going to have to beat a good side, aren't you, to win the cup? So, yeah, maybe it could be them. Yeah, and, and staying on the FA Cup as well, um, depending on how Newcastle, how far Newcastle get in the end, the prospect of possibly commentating on an FA Cup semi-final or an FA Cup final, it, fingers crossed. Um, the prospect of that for you must be completely amazing. You must be stoked at the at the, at the thought of that. Well, I love Wembley. Um, we've been there to play Spurs in the last couple of years and it, it's a great, great venue. Um, and, and when the fans were coming in in that little corner on the far side um, in the, the bottom tier, um, I, I just looked at it and I thought, if this place was half full with with black and whites, it would be it would be amazing. It would be it would be something that I think would probably, yeah, whatever the result, I don't think you would forget the experience, and and I would dearly dearly love to see it. I've been lucky enough to to do some non league cup finals at Wembley, FA Vars, a conference playoff final. Um, with Gateshead, unfortunately, they lost. But all the FA Vars finals involving North East non-league teams I've been to, they've won. And Wembley's a place for winners. And mm-hmm. when the sun is shining and you've won at Wembley, there's no better feeling. Um, mm-hmm. And you can get yourself really excited thinking about it. But, of course, you've, you've got to earn the right to be there. Um, mm-hmm. 
and it and it would just it would just be great I think to go there having earned it in a cup rather than the league game against Spurs um, to go there have half the stadium and then have the chance to either get to the final or to actually win something it would be so meaningful I think the fans of course they crave it but they deserve it I think the club needs it as well um, whether it happens this season or not I don't know but you know in fairness to them Steve Bruce set his stall out in the summer, wanted to take the Cup seriously, got knocked down on penalties a few weeks later by Leicester in the League Cup after after doing OK, doing OK. And that was disappointing. But even even Mike Ashley and Lee Charnley have said this season, they said to Steve Bruce, have a bit of a go at the Cups. Now, the draw helps. I get that. It's not like we've beaten the top three or four in the Premier League to go through, but you're not in control of the draw but he has named strong teams throughout and we've needed two replays, but it means that whether highest score is still left in the cup, we've had a few games, a few goals, some nice moments and let, let's hope it can continue this season. Depending on whether the season is continued, um, depending on how it's continued, where can you see Newcastle finishing? Will we be higher up the table? Will we be about where we are? Can we drop down a little bit? What do you expect? Well, on our total sports show on uh, BBC Newcastle, we, made predictions uh, just before the season began. And I said Newcastle would finish 12th. Um, and after about six weeks of the season, I thought mm, I might be a bit optimistic there. Not because I don't believe in the players and not because I, I, I dislike Steve Bruce. I um, absolutely want him to succeed because if he succeeds, it means Newcastle's doing well. And, and whether we, you know, if you're a fan, whether you like the manager, whether you want someone else, fundamentally you know underneath it all you want your team to win and to succeed um so i think probably now everything's settled down and, and there's been some good results and we've had a bit of time to look at the way the team plays and other teams in the league i think they may well finish around that i mean they you could make a case for them getting into the top half if you look at the games that are left could they win four or five of the remaining fixtures i think it's i think it's possible i think they could win at least one away game and probably a couple of the home matches, certainly. So you, you could see that. Um, but of course, if football is different when it comes back, if it comes back this season, that may have a, a bearing on it. I'm just glad that we have that buffer, that cushion, and we don't have to be in the position of, say, a Bournemouth, Aston Villa, West Ham, yeah. uh, Norwich as well, I guess, to think, you know, what, what could this mean for us? Could, could they be relegated? Could it be done on a points per game basis? Thankfully, if, if you apply any of those metrics, those criteria, Newcastle will be will be OK. And, and yeah, I would say, I think if the season had just continued in, in the normal fashion, uh, irrespective of any cup run, I would have said, I would have stuck to my original uh, prediction of, uh, of around 12 similar points tally to the, to the last two seasons. Yep, um, I'd have to agree with that as well. It's uh, Newcastle are definitely going to stay up, I think, whatever happens, even if football is different when it comes back. Um, but you do have to feel for the teams around that relegation zone, uh, lower down the table, because I think fans are a massive part of football and fans can change a the result. They are the 12th man after all. Um, so, yeah, massive, massive decisions to be made by the Premier League. Thank you very much for those words, Matthew. And it's been an absolute pleasure, can I just say, to have you on. Um, you'd be welcome back any time. Um, so this has been Matthew Raisbeck, um, BBC Radio Newcastle commentator. Thank you very much, guys, for watching. I'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye bye.